全 Micro iPad 是目前企业中常见的产品之一，万一出现漏洞，势必会造成重大的危害。这场议程将由 StarLab 的网页安全研究员针对该产品的漏洞做所做的研究。让我们掌声欢迎嘉豪带来的演讲。Hello, hello. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my sharing today. My name is Jia Hao, and I'm from Singapore. So I hope you guys will hear, enjoy hearing about my experience with exploring Trend Micro applications. And this will be my first time speaking at a conference, so I thank Hikon for giving me the opportunity. I hope everything goes smoothly. First, I'll do a quick introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Jia Hao, and I'm currently working as a web security researcher at StarLab Singapore for the past two years. Uh, my interests lie in uh, researching web applications for old days and end days. Previously, I've researched into various uh, open source code bases with some success. Besides vulnerability research, I have also some experience in pen testing. Okay, uh, let's go through the agenda for today's sharing. First, I'll give an overview of the two Trend Micro Enterprise applications that I'll be talking about. This includes uh, background information about where the web files are, important directories, and how the routing works. Next, I'll go into technical details about the separate RCE chains that leverages classic techniques. The first one is a post off file upload to a SQL injection to RCE. The second is a pre off RCE chain consisting of three bugs, which are off bypass, limited file upload, and limited LFI. Finally, the third chain is another post off RCE. We'll then conclude and talk about any potential future research. So, today's goal is to hopefully raise awareness about our enterprise applications research field. Although we see uh, many groundbreaking bugs that suddenly appear in large enterprise applications, I believe there are still many to be uncovered. As researchers, we all know how sometimes the hardest step is to obtain a copy of the software to set it up in a test environment. But if you put in the work, sometimes these applications have a lot of unreported bugs, either due to legacy code or there just wasn't a lot of independent research put into them yet. Today, I'll be sharing about my research journey, which has yielded multiple CVEs, but more importantly, I'll also be sharing about the technical details, about the vulnerabilities, as well as the POCs. Trend Micro offers a plethora of applications, solutions, and products. They are often split into two types, home and business solutions. Today, we'll be looking at the business solutions, as I believe there are more uh, features to test, and finding any bugs will have a larger impact. As for why I chose to research into Trend Micro applications, it was initially it's because I was looking at end days and I saw that there's a lot of legacy PHP looking code, so I decided to get a closer look into it. If you look at the enterprise applications page, uh, it's abundant. There's an entire section for its products that's A to Z. Uh, some of them are like Apex Central, Apex One, Mobile Security. Uh, this often comes with a web dashboard for admins to have an easier time in management. The main applications for today are Apex Central and Mobile Security. First, let's briefly talk about uh, Apex Central. It was originally called Control Manager, but was later rebranded to Apex Central. However, even though it rebranded itself, there's a lot of legacy code that was carried over. This app allows sys admins to ensure consistent data and threat protection policies across registered endpoints. Essentially, this web dashboard is full of features that help the SOC to view security incidents and perform detailed investigations for each alert. After looking closely at the tech stack, I found that it is built using quite a number of technologies. We'll see that there's C Sharp, Microsoft SQL, PHP, Java, Node.js, and even SQL Lite. There's just so much going on in this application. Next, there's Mobile Security Enterprise. Trend Micro calls it a centralized management where administration of mobile devices in the enterprise can be streamlined. It allows the sys admins to restrict the use of unauthorized applications on uh, corporate devices, for example. Similarly to Apex Central, this web dashboard comes with all the features you need to perform MDM tasks. For example, one of the functions on the dashboard allows you to manage some CA certificates on all the mobile devices. OK, a common trend among these applications is uh, code reusability. On one hand, having a modular code base is a good strategy to ensure that application features are easily extendable. On the other hand, it also means that if you find a bug in a particular module, and if that same module is used in other applications, you also get to report those extra bugs for free. So the directories that I'll be talking about next largely refers to the web components of these applications. Inside these apps, there are actually some binaries that are also 
expose some services on various ports, but today we'll not be looking at those. So if you look at the, uh, the installation directory, uh, there's this widget directory, which can be found directory, directly in the web root of both applications. This is where we start to see uh, overlapping between both applications. Some of the important ones that we should take note of today are the repository directory, as well as the proxy controller PHP file, as highlighted here. So we'll first take a look at the repository directory. So uh, further inside, there's another one called WP1. So once again, the structures are identical, and we're only interested in a few. Proxy and the four widget related directories. The, module, the modularity of the code can be seen here, as this is where all the extended features are sta saved at. This code base closely follows the model view controller model, or MVC. The controller and model can be found in the proxy directory, whereas the view can be found in the widget directories. This means that if we are interested in server-side vulnerabilities, we should take a look at the proxy directory, and whereas in the widget directories, we'll find a bunch of front-end JavaScript files where we can search for client-side vulnerabilities. Inside the proxy directory, you'll find a bunch of modules. By the way, there's a web config file which prevents direct browsing to this directory. So in order to interact with any of these modules, you have to go through the proxy controller file that I mentioned just now, and you'll load the proxy file of the desired module. This, this is an example of uh, using the proxy controller file to indicate the module that we wish to load by specifying the module parameter. OK, uh, now that we are clear on how the applications are built and how to access each individual module, we can head into the technical details of the different bug chains today. For each chain, I'll be sharing about the different bugs used uh, as part of it, analyze the root causes, and finally, some the exploitation and official patch reviews. The first chain is from Apex Central. In this chain, expect to see an interesting SQL injection bug, which arises from a file upload. The sync is very simple, but the exploitation process is an adventure on its own. So let's take a look. I found two uh, SQL injection vulnerabilities, which both led to code execution. This is interesting because the impacted database was SQL Lite, even though the application largely relies on Microsoft SQL for most of its operations. The vulnerable code resides inside this module called TMMS. Uh, it ignores the Microsoft SQL database and opted to use its own SQLite database. We can confirm this by taking a look at the module's PDO constructor. This is also the class that contains the vulnerable functions which we'll see later on. According to the constructor, we can see that the SQLite database is found in the tmms.db file. If we take a look at it, we only see that there's a single table which stores some generic data such as public certificates and nothing sensitive. Even though there's a column for storing certificate passwords, the code that writes to this uh, left it as a hard-coded empty string. Let's dive into where the injection sync is inside this function called addSert within the same class. This function takes in a cert variable, which is expected to contain various key pair values. Key value pairs, sorry. Immediately, the issue will be obvious if you are familiar with SQL injection syncs, as the code simply concatenates the data from the cert variable into the SQL query. The injection occurs when the, the code immediately executes the query without sanitization. So far, this is straightforward and very understandable. But first, we have to see if we can even reach this sync. So maybe the developers added some sanitization or checks in between, or if this function is even called at all. Luckily for us, uh, searching for references revealed one result, which happens to be in the same directory. The function upload x509 certs is the one that calls add certs. To improve readability, I have removed a lot of code that are not relevant. As you can see, the function takes in a single argument and labels it as foul. This variable is read before being stored into a PHP variable called x509 buff. And the file content is subsequently passed into the PHP function open SSL x509 pass, which checks if the file has a valid certificate syntax. If the uploaded file is synthetically correct, a custom certificate object will be returned and assigned into the cert object variable. The code then goes into initializing a DB cert variable containing a dictionary where name and issuer are set using the common names of the cert that we have that is uh, in the argument. As mentioned before, the password field has been hard-coded as an empty string. 
Other certificate fields such as expiry date and upload time are also initialized. Subsequently, this DB cert variable is passed into our vulnerable asset function. So far, this looks a bit promising since as long as you can control the certificate content inside the file variable, we should be able to reach the sync. Something that we should bear in mind is that the open SSL X509 pass PHP function to see, you will check if the uploaded file is a valid certificate. We might have to massage our input later to fit into these requirements. Now to search for another function reference to this and hope that it is not an unused function. Again, we are lucky as this function is indeed used by the TMMS modules proxy file. As we went through earlier, a modules proxy file is loaded whenever we request for a particular module through the proxy controller file. In this case, if we take a look at the proxy exec function, we see that the upload x509 search function is eventually invoked. There are a few conditions that has to be met in order to reach the path of this upload x509 function. For example, HTTP parameters are obtained through the CGI arcs array. This is an array that uh, combines get and post parameters from any incoming HTTP request into a single variable. So this means we, we need to set either a get or a post request post parameter called TMMS CMD. It has to be set to this string set certificates config. And once we reach this part of the code, the, you will obtain the file from our request body under the third file name parameter. This file is then stored inside the file variable. Eventually, our uploaded file is passed as an argument to the X, upload x509 cert. So that's great. We have a full path from a source to the injection sync. We just have to send a post request with a file in the body, and this file will reach the injection sync. However, since we have noted that the code performs syntax checking on uploaded file, we just have to make sure that the payload is compliant. In theory, we should be able to just craft an X509 certificate which contains our injection payload in the issuer and subject's common name. This should be straightforward, right? Before we proceed to craft the actual POC, we should review what the requirements are. We are able to control the name and issuer of the certificate, and these names get concatenated into the SQL query, which gets executed. Additionally, since the SQL function uses exec instead of query, we're able to perform stack queries. This means that multiple SQL statements can be executed in the same connection. Actually, since the only table in the database does not store anything sensitive, let's think if we can do better than just SQL injection. Since we are dealing with SQL lights in a PHP instance, this is the classic the CTF challenge. So there are no ways to achieve RCE. For example, if we can try writing a web shell using the attached database, or we can use the low extension function, but that is dis disabled by default. So let's try to avoid methods that increase the complexity as much as possible, unless we have no choice. To use the attached database method, we have to, to, to use the da attached database method to create a web shell on the target, we have to insert these three lines into our certificate fields. So let's modify the payload to suit our scenario. Additionally, we have to terminate the existing query with dummy values, otherwise the SQL query will fail. To do so, we can terminate it with once, and we found that the PHP process uh, can write to the directory called repository, and it is reachable by browsing to it directly. So we can write our web shell there. However, our first piece of bad news is here. The current payload is not possible to be used because According to RFC 5280, in order to form a compliance certificate, its common name field has a length limit of 64 characters. Our current payload exceeds this at 211 characters. Maybe a simple payload that exfiltrates data can fit into this limitation, but today we are going for code execution. Furthermore, the database has nothing sensitive to exfiltrate. So what should we do? In order to achieve our goal, we have no choice but to go code golfing in order to shrink our payload. We have two injection points, so we can afford 128 characters in our payload. To make matters worse, since the input is at two different sections of maximum 64 characters each, characters have to split. Characters must be used to comment out the existing query between the injection points. The exact path, the exact path to split the payload will be decided at a later time when our payload is a lot shorter. Since the payload consists of components relating to SQLite, PHP, and Windows, we must be creative in order to reduce the payload size. 
So this is our current 211 character payload. Let's remove redundant spaces throughout the payload, and after minimizing it, the payload now looks like this. To maintain readability, I'm still showing the new lines, but the actual payload is in a single, single line. Let's shorten the PHP web shell next as it is unnecessarily long. We can make use of the short echo tag and substituting the exact function with backticks. So now the payload will look like this. And it is not bad as we are now below 200 characters, still far from where we need to be though. Let's see what we can do about the Windows path next, which honestly took out a good chunk of the payload length. We can make use of the 8.3 file naming syntax since it limits the length of each directory and file name to eight characters. To obtain the 8.3 file name, we can simply execute a command in that directory. And immediately, we'll see that the payload size will be reduced by a sizable amount, but this is still insufficient. So now is a good time to stop and consider if a full path is even necessary. So by changing the path to simply a.php and observing process monitor, can be, it can be seen that the application attempts to write to a directory that is very close to our intended destination. In fact, the directory is right, trying to write to is so near that we just need to append repository to it. So let's update our payload, which will now finally look like this. So uh, what do you guys think? Does it look like it will fit? So uh, yes, it does. We finally arrived at a payload which fits the 128 character limit at 122 characters long. Don't forget we still have to split this into two chunks. So let's split it like such. Adding the common characters added three characters in total, bringing the final payload to be 125 characters long. Here are the effective queries that will be executed. The highlighted parts are our injection payload. We can ignore the parts after the insert, our insert statement as the PDO did not make use of transactions. So the last step is to obtain the actual certificate itself. Generating the certificate is straightforward. We just generate the CA and then the issuer to be signed by the CA. In both cases, the common names have to be set to each half of the payload. These are the commands that I use, but I will just skip it over because the slides will, might possibly be distributed for reference. If all goes well, the certificate will end up looking like this. So have you seen a certificate that looked like this before? <laughs> now we just have to send the actual post request containing this certificate, and our a.php web shell will be created. Since this is a post off exploit, I took some time to find some off bypass, but unfortunately I had no luck with it. So the next best thing was to find an XSS and to make it a one-click RCE. Luckily, there were multiple XSS vulnerabilities, which means that we can now do a one-click RCE. Uh, putting everything together, this is how the one-click will look like when the victim authenticated victim loads the URL. So as you can see, the web shell has been created in the directory, and the RC has been achieved. Of course, if you somehow got hold of valid credentials, even for a low privilege user, you can exploit it by, you can exploit these vulnerabilities to achieve RC as well. So uh, we will likely publish the POC for this after the conference, uh, after some clearance, along with the slides itself. Okay, uh, after the web shell is uploaded, no authentication is required to access it, so persistence is also achieved for the attacker. Okay, let's review the bug chain. Remember that two CVEs were given. That is because there's another vulnerable function uh, in, in the same module. Actually, there are a few more uh, CVEs that are given for all the various XSS bugs as well. In any case, we have seen how a supposedly straightforward SQL injection seem impossible to exploit until we go golfing. We were stroke of luck and having all of the stars aligned for us, the exploitation was indeed possible as we golfed out the perfect length payload. So all that worked just for a simple patch as the developer simply just needed to use prepared statements as to the queries. So this concludes our analysis for the first bug chain. So uh, that was uh, exciting. You can anticipate how much anticipation I have while trying to golf out that payload. 
for now, let's context switch as we are looking at the second chain at mobile security. This is also an interesting one, so let's take a look. In this second chain, you will see three separate bugs, uh, an off bypass, a limited file upload, as well as a limited LFI. You might wonder what does limited mean in this case, but we'll take a closer look at it soon. Surprisingly, this app comes with two main endpoints, widget and widget for security. If you try to diff the different endpoints, you'll see that they are really identical to the point that if you find a section of the code in one, it can also be found in the other endpoint. This means that any bug we find in one endpoint will give us a second one for free. As such, a second full chain consisting of the same conditions were found in total, and we will assign six CVs for these two bug chains. Let us begin by finding the off bypass. To do this, we must first understand how authentication works in this application. After digging through, I discovered the application checks for the validity of two cookies, session info and PHP session ID. Also, since the application binds session info to PHP session ID, we just need to es establish how session info is generated and to see if there are any flaws in it. Let's trace from the source this time round instead. This is the part of this part of the code from the index PHP page where the user authentication is checked near the top of the script. We see that a user file is included into this script, and then a WF user class is instantiated. Let's take a look at how the WF user class is constructed, as there are functions from this class that we may be interested in. What happens under the hood of the constructor is that a database handle is obtained and tied to the WF user instance. This database handle has constructor arguments, which are obtained from a config file. And from this config file, we can see that the database used here is SQLite. This is confusing since this application also has a Microsoft SQL database that is set up during the installation. So what is SQLite doing in this application? Will it be another gateway to RC again? Opening the SQLite file, we see that the user's table that was referenced in the constructor just now. However, the table is only empty even though there should be a default root account that was created upon the installation of the application. Perhaps this database is used for other purposes. Going back to the index page, we see that the product user init function of the WF user class is executed. This function contains the code for authenticating a user. And inside this function, the first line invokes a product get session username function, which returns data that will be stored in this email variable. What it does is to simply return the value set inside the username key of the PHP session. And if we look deeper at where this value is set, we can see that it's actually controllable, controllable by us. We just have to set the request session info cookie with a common delimiter. Now that we are in control of the email variable, let's con continue tracing the product user init function. Next, there are two functions. Uh, recover session by email and load user by email, which basically checks if the email that we supplied already exists in the database. Since we have no knowledge of any valid email addresses, so let's just skip this first, as we are interested in a particular function below, which is the one at the bottom near, uh, near the bottom called create user, which sounds interesting. It looks like it takes the email argument from a default blank password and a default blank password to be used as the arguments to the database function at users. And this function is simply inserts a row into the user's table using our controllable string as the email value and the hard-coded blank string as the password. Unfortunately, there's no injection vulnerability here, so we can't do the same trick as the previous chain. However, this means that we can insert arbitrary rows into the user table. In order to create a new user, we simply have to set the session info cookie with a common delimiter. For example, let us set our email as fubar. Then we open the user's table to confirm that a new row was indeed added successfully. So what's next? After the user row is created, the code continues to invoke yet another function called bind user. This bind user function is straightforward as it just sets a bunch of session variables and at the final line, it sets this off variable to true. This variable is checked in various sections of the app, so this means that the current PHP session ID cookie will pass authentication checks. If we look at the Burp Suite screenshot just now, notice that we are granted this user ID cookie 
which proves that we are indeed authenticated. To conclude, we just have to set the session info cookie to be a comma followed by any value to authenticate since the application will kindly create a new user for us. This design is surely an oversight saying that accounts are freely created by simply setting arbitrary cookie values and with blank passwords nonetheless. Now that we have an off bypass, we can look at a uh, far upload bug and most of the functionalities are locked behind authentication. So it's good that we have found a bypass. And in Trend Micro Mobile Security, there's only two module proxies. So looking into them did not take too long. In this case, the vulnerability resides in this mod TMM SPM module. So this is the vulnerable sync. Once again, this is a proxy file. So the proxy exec function will be executed when this module is loaded. Then the function retrieve data is invoked. We're interested in entering this particular switch case called set certificates config as it will eventually lead to a file upload feature. To do so, we first have to set our HTTP request parameter, TMMS action, to the value. The code does a bunch of processing, but in essence, our uploaded file is moved to the Windows temp directory. Up to this point, no verification of the uploaded file was done. This behavior of uploaded, uploading to outside of the web route is why I mentioned that we are getting a limited file upload primitive. We can upload a web shell here, but we won't be able to browse to it to trigger it directory, directly. The Windows temp directory can be found at c slash windows slash temp. Technically, this can be argued to be a valid vulnerability since it is possible for bad actors to upload malware to the target server. But in order to make our exploit cleaner and reduce the attack, attack complexity once again, we should see if we can do better, such as finding an LFI bug, which will let us achieve code execution. Let's imagine that we have uploaded our malicious PHP web shell to the server, and it now resides in the Windows temp directory. We just have to look for LFI that lets us include this file. We can search for require and include directories to see if there are any instances where we can influence the file path then point it to our uploaded file. Although there were no straightforward uh, LFI bugs to be found, I was able to find a limited one. What this means is that we are able to influence the part of the path, but the file name is fixed. Fortunately, our upload primitive allows us to freely control the file name and extension. OK, so the LFI sync can be found in this uh, widget pool factory abstract class. Observe that this highlighted function takes in an optional single argument labeled as string update type. Then, this argument is passed to this get upper camera case function, and its return value is stored into the string file name variable. This variable is then concatenated as part of the require once directory, and since there are no input validation in place, it seems that if we can control this function argument, we should be able to perform tra path traversal to manipulate the path to the pool manager PHP file to be included. We should verify that the get upper camera case function does not destroy our payload during its processing. This function sim appears to simply convert the input to lower case, a bunch of replacements, and the resultant string is returned. At first glance, it looks uh, worrying because it might destroy our payload since it converts all casing to lower case. However, we don't have to worry because we are on Windows where directory names are case insensitive. So now that we know that the function is vulnerable to LFI, we can look for references to this, to this function. There were a few references, but only one where we can control the argument. It also happens to be directly accessible from the web application, so that is very good for us. This endpoint expects a JSON body in the HTTP request, does a bunch of processing, and eventually we see that the vulnerable get widget pool manager function gets invoked inside one of the switch case. The argument uses the value supplied from the JSON body, and it's perfect as it means that we have full control over what goes into this vulnerable function. To reach the sync, the JSON key act has to be set to check, and our payload should go inside the update type key. So for the update type key, we just have to pad with our path traversal sequence and append the Windows temp directory path. Let's attempt to test the chain. Assume that our upload, we have used the upload primitive to upload our file to the temp directory, and it is called poolmanager.php, and this file contains just a simple PHP info invocation. 
Next, we send the request to the target endpoint and setting the update type to contain the path traversal sequence. We see the output of PHP info demonstrating that our LFI was indeed successful. With all three bugs prime and ready to be combined into a single chain, we can proceed to write an exploit to chain everything together to achieve an unoff RCE. So similar to the first chain, we will make the exploit publicly available when after some uh, clearance. Next, let's examine the official patch that was pushed out. This is the patch for the authentication bypass. So what it does is to, it, it takes place in the product off page where the authentication is first checked during page requests. As you can see, the application no longer blindly trusts the session info cookie. Instead, it now expects an additional TMMS token cookie that is assigned when the user is authenticated via the web portal using valid credentials. So this resolves the issue where the user supplied session info cookie was blindly trusted to the point that it even creates a user when the email is non-existent. Next, we will look at how the arbitrary file upload was patched. The uploaded file name now has its extension checked against of a list of hard-coded allowed extensions. If the uploaded file does not end with any of these extensions, it will fail. So this definitely patches against the full chain, seeing that we now need to seeing that we originally needed to upload a file with a PHP extension. Finally, for the LFI patch, we see that the function argument value is now checked against an allow list of strings, similar to how the file upload was patched. This means that we are no longer able to supply a path traversal sequence. I believe this is an effective patch that patches against this LFI primitive. To conclude, we have discussed the various exploit we have discussed the full exploit chain from pre-off to the RC itself. Due to the nature of the code base, any bugs we find at one endpoint likely has another copy of itself at the other endpoint. The official patches are also satisfactory, which prevents future exploitations of these bugs in the application. Okay, so for the third bug chain, uh, unfortunately I'm not able to show the technical analysis today. We will likely publish it again uh, in due time. Similar to the previous bugs we have seen, uh, it has multiple primitives chained together, although individually these in primitives are very limited. Nonetheless, we can still see this redacted image and the redacted POC. Yeah, so that's the third chain that resulted in RCE that I found among my research. I started by finding variants after getting inspired from the other bugs. So hopefully we can publish it soon, as it demonstrates how limited primitives that are not impactful on its own can still find its users. Okay, next, next up, let's take a look at how a, a few other bugs that I found in these applications. Surprisingly, there are a lot of straightforward things for XSS. As seen from this example, there is, there's basically no sanitization. The value of the incoming server ID parameter is directly echoed in the server response. So this was found in some endpoint which was eventually removed. Oh, another one, this is also another straightforward one. So it's surprising to see so many low hanging fruits at uh, enterprise application. And there are some access SSRF bugs which allows the attacker to force the server to send arbitrary web requests and display the response back. So this bug allows attackers to reach internal network resources and access it. Due to time constraints, I'll just show the POC, but we'll also publish them, the exploit itself. So this is the first SSRF. And the second one, which actually looks the same, but they, because they're variants of each other. <laughs> Okay, so actually there are still a few other bugs awaiting patch, so I apologize for not being able to share them today, but we're also still waiting for the patch itself. And actually that's all I have for today, so let's see if we have any potential future research in this area before concluding our session. Today we have seen two 
train micro enterprise applications out of, out of the many that are available. For future research, I firmly believe that if researchers are to find a bug pattern in one of these applications, they are likely able to find the same bug in other offerings. So this, this definitely applies not just to web components, but maybe the binaries as well. Code reuse is real, and coupled with the fact that the code base is quite old, the potential to find bugs is there. Don't be surprised to see when you see uh, new products being launched, but when you look into the code base, you see a lot of legacy code. So let's recap some of the key points today. First is to always note down the various primitives you may find in the code base when you are researching it. Even though these are unexploitable on its own, you may never know when you are able to find another one, another primitive, to form a full chain. Incomplete exploit chains today may be completed when developers add new features to the application. For example, this code here just needs a file write feature that allows uh, us to write any PHP file, even if it's outside of the web route. Secondly, is to not give up easily when a bug seems hard or impossible to exploit at first. We have also seen how the SQL injection today required uh, code golfing to be exploitable. Of course, you still need some luck to encounter these kind of scenarios. And finally, what we have examined today is not just limited to trend micro solutions as there are many other uh, big, company, big solutions out there. Always remember to research ethically by reporting any findings so that they can get patched. Last but not least, uh, thank you for taking the time to sit, to sit through my talk. I hope you have learned something new or interesting from my sharing today, and I'll appreciate any feedback that you guys may have. Otherwise, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you. Hello,我们谢谢江泽精彩的分享。那接下来是Q&A的环节。请问会场现场有人想问问题的吗? 那个是举手吗? 后面那个伸懒腰。好,那我自己想问, <笑> Can I speak in Chinese? Yes, uh, OK, uh, I'll try my best. <笑> 就是那个就是你的OSPYPASS的那个patch,它是用了一个local server用curl去验证。它是什么?它就是那个OSPYPASS的那个patch。patch,对。对,那它用了curl。它就现在他们就用那个Microsoft SQL去authenticate。所以它是curl到一个local的URL。它自己的database setup。啊了解了解了解了解所以那边确认patch是OK的 对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对对